you have helped so much here. How many of you are working children's church right now? Would you stand our children's church workers? Where are you at? Children's church workers. There's two. There's. We appreciate these. All right. Yeah. 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 We had about a <clears throat> we had about a two hour meeting right before service tonight, and you're going to be excited what's going on in children's church and some of the things that's going to be happening. Uh, they have faithfully, faithfully worked in children's church for years, and they have got some wonderful ideas, and uh, I'm excited about them and all that they have done and are going to do and are doing, so pray for them. My wife is home, but you don't know that. She's home from the hospital, so praise the Lord for that. You have your Bibles open to the book of Jude. If you don't know where it is, go to the book of Revelation, turn back, one book, and that is the book of Jude. One chapter, only 25 verses. We're going to look at verse 17 through verse 25. Verse 17 through verse 25. And we'll look at that and read that. Um, read it out of NIV. You're looking, if you're whatever version you're in. Jude says this, But dear friends, remember what the apostle of our Lord Jesus Christ foretold. They said to you, in the last times there will be scoffers who will follow their own ungodly desires Verse 19, these are the people who divide you, who follow mere natural instincts and do not have the Spirit. Verse 20, but you, dear friends, by building yourselves up in the most holy faith and praying in the Holy Spirit, keep yourselves in God's love as you wait for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ to bring you to eternal life. Be merciful to those who doubt. Save others by snatching them from the fire do others show mercy mixed with fear, hating even the clothes stained by the corrupt flesh? Verse 24, to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you before his glorious presence without fault and with a great joy. Verse 25, to the only God of our Savior to be glory and majesty and power and authority through Jesus Christ our Lord before all ages, now and forever. Amen. Remember when they had the seatbelt law that uh, became state or national? 1964 to 1996. I don't know about you, but I had a very difficult time wearing a seatbelt. I, I, I just had a hard time. I remember when I was a child, we had a, we had a car, we had nine kids in a little car. We used to buy, ride in the back window, laying down, right in the back window. I mean, if Dad ever had a wreck, we'd be airborne. I mean, I'm telling you, we rode back there. I mean, I read about a man in New Zealand. He took it to the extreme. He got so many, t in fact, 32 times he was pulled over not having a seatbelt. 32 times. He spent all kinds of money on those tickets over five years. Finally, he got really mad. So what he did, instead of obeying the law, he, he made a seatbelt out of paper. And he put it on himself so when a state trooper or a high patrol, I mean, or a cop walked, uh, went by him, they saw he had a seatbelt, but it was a paper seatbelt. Ah, oh, he was so happy about it. He hung that thing over his shoulder, and he thought, we got it made. He tricked the law. His trick worked for a while. One day he had a head-on collision, and it threw him to, into the steering wheel, and he was killed. The fake seatbelt couldn't save him. The moral of the story is, when trouble comes, that which is fake won't save you. For the Christian, when the test comes, that which is fake won't save you. I want you to look at the book of Jude tonight. Jude writes a letter concerning our salvation. In fact, it seems like his desire was to concentrate on true, what is really true salvation, that which is real. In fact, when you read Jude, Jude informs us about the life of the Lord Jesus Christ, the Son of God, the one who was incarnation the one who became flesh, he became a man and dwelt among us. He talks about the one who died on the cross and rose from the grave the third day, the one who gives eternal life. In fact, Jude seems to be writing about a problem. When he writes about that problem, a problem that seems even the trouble we have in today's life, just like a man who used a fake seatbelt, Jude writes about the fakery that's within the church in America and the world. It's talking about the fake gospel that is preached every Sunday morning in many churches in our world. We experience what is called a watered-down gospel, a fake gospel where the truth is not told or is half told. Jude writes about to the church about once, the had, once who had the real 
now, but now have a false paper-drawn gospel. It's a fake. It is weak. It is a lie. And the dangerous people are living by what used to be the real gospel. It looks like the real gospel, but in reality, it is nothing but a bucket of paper, seatbelt type fake gospel. He in writing the church that left this common salvation, a faith that once was real. Now it is a fake gospel. Listen, the truth of the gospel has been delivered to them. It had once been delivered to them, but they have either had not accepted it anymore they have ignored it and just walked away from it. They have substituted it with the, fake, with the fake. Now they don't want the real. They just want the fake, the feel-good religion. If they don't feel good in church, then they don't care about the real. If it don't, does not make them feel good, if they don't get a buzz on Sunday morning, if they don't get some type of feeling, then they don't care. They want that that makes them feel good. They don't want the real thing. And they accept the substitute instead of the genuine. In fact, what, is, what a shame, what a scam it is, what a tragedy. I don't know if you've ever read the book of Jude. But now we, we need to take a good some time. And you need to take some time to read it and to study it. Jude really lets us know the problem. In fact, and then he begins to share with us the deep fear and the deep concern for those who have not received the truth or have received a substitute. A fake instead of its place. Charles Colton, who was president of Prison Fellowship, writes this, and I quote, Most Christians do not understand what they believe, why they believe it, and why it matters. For two years, Colton asked mature believers to name the fundamentals of the faith. And most of them, he says, look surprised and perplexed. They come up with a short list. Colton has stopped in the middle of some of his speeches and asked the audience that was just nothing but Christians what is Christianity anyway? And one church, Baptist, a Bible Baptist church in the southern belt. And he asked the same question. What is Christianity? And there was silence for what he seemed to be a full minute. And nobody, nobody could tell him what Christianity was. In fact, in those three or four painful minutes, he was shocked. Colton went on to say and conclude, our ignorance in the church of America it's crippling us. And one of the biggest dangers in our church today that we're suffering from is our members do not know how to defend the faith. We don't, have no, we don't know. We're so concerned about our, our, outward religiosity. We don't defend the inward faith of the gospel. We don't know about it. We don't have a worldview. And we're not concerned about a worldview. We don't teach a worldview. All we teach is about certain things, and that's all we're concerned about. The church is fighting the church. They're not fighting the truth of the gospel. They could care less about the worldview. All they want you to know is certain things that they think is right and not what the gospel truly is. They know what they, what they, want, they may believe, but they cannot tell you why they believe it. Do you know why you believe what you believe? Can you actually tell someone about what the truth is about the gospel. They attend church. They attend Sunday school. They attend children's ministries and youth, <coughs> excuse me, and youth ministries and VBS, but they cannot defend their faith. They don't have a biblical worldview. They are dead. They're dead in the water with no fuel in their tank. They can't go any farther. Understand when testing comes and we don't have a real thing, we are in trouble. As we approach the end of the book of Jude, we see a seriousness in Jude's language and his writings and his heart about false truth, about false teaching. Jude seems to just spend a lot of quality time, just about that, and also just about the right time, on this grave subject of false teaching. Verse 17 through 25, he emphasizes the responsibility to deal with biblical, biblically, I'm telling biblical truth with false teaching. If we don't know the truth, we will swallow a lie. If we don't know the truth, we can't defend a lie. We can't go against it. If someone in your office or someone at work challenge you, challenge you about the Bible, challenge you about biblical truth, can you defend a biblical worldview? Do you even know what a biblical worldview is? Has it been taught in your Sunday school class? Has it been taught in your church? 
Do you know what the fundamentals of the faith are? Do you know what cardinal doctrine is? If you don't, church, we are in trouble. The world knows what they believe, and they'll challenge you on every side. Do we have an answer to their questions? Or do we walk away from them stunned by their questions? In fact, it's interesting. He closes his letter with important truth. What is our responsibility to false teachers and teaching? How should we handle what they throw at us? How dangerous are they? And do that, do, to deal with false teaching, we need to know the truth. If we don't know the, tr know the truth, we can't deal with a lie. In fact, when I, and I said this so many times, every time they hire a bank teller, they run the truth by them. They show them what real, real, real money is. They let them feel it, they let them smell it, they let them handle it. And then when they throw something wrong, a counterfeit by them, they can pick it out every time. We send, spend so much time in Sunday school and other classes talking about stories, talking about this and talking about that. Spend half and maybe three quarters of our Sunday school class talking about what happened this week and that. Talking about news and politics and all that other stuff. We never get to the truth. We talk about stories and what happened to us this week. Listen to me. I don't care about stories. I don't care about politics. I don't care about what, all these other things. We better get to the truth of God's Word. We're not here to make you feel good. We're here to teach you the biblical truths of God's Word. Because there's lies out there that are robbing the church of Jesus Christ. And if we don't teach them how to stand and what to stand for, they're not going to stand. We're losing our children by the groves right under our feet. Because we're not teaching them the truth. Listen, we need to saturate and so saturate ourselves with the truth. When the false teaching comes our way, we'll reject it without a doubt. And we'll be able to say that we need to know and we do know the truth. And listen, we need, we'll say we need to take three steps to hold on to what is real. And let me give you three steps tonight. Number one, we ought to not be shocked when they con we are confronted with false teachers. We ought not to be shocked. We're warned that false teachers are on every side of us, and they're coming. And as, ten time, as the end times approaches us, there are going to be more and more false teaching. They're going to be in the pulpits. I could name you preachers right now that ha one preacher has over 56,000 members in his church, one of the largest churches in America. He is a false teacher. He doesn't believe in hell. He doesn't believe you have to be saved to go to heaven. You can be a Hindu and go to heaven. He says he is not going to preach on sin. He doesn't believe you can sin and go to hell. He believes that we're all God's children. He preaches on a feel-good salvation. God loves everybody. No matter what you do, God all he wants you to do. In fact, we're little gods. And people are swallowing it. Like, I, I saw members of different churches. And some members of the churches I pastored went in their home, and they had some of his books. He said, aren't they good? I said, yeah, for trash. I said, get that junk out of your house. Oh, they're so good. Make me feel better. I said, yeah, they, you may feel better, but they don't do a bit of good for you. They're harming what you think. Look at verse 7 through 19. But, dear friend, I like it. He calls them dear friend. Sets them up. But, dear friend, remember what the apostles of our Lord Jesus Christ foretold. You've already been told this, but you forgot it. Remember, he said, they told you that in the last time there'll be scoffers who will follow their own ungodly desires. They're there for purpose, to gain their own self and their money and their, their, their lifestyle. These are people who divide you, who follow mere natural instincts and do not have the spirit. As you slowly read this letter, it's important that you understand it's not interesting that, Ju that Jude literally reiterates that we already know the Scriptures. Isn't it interesting? He said, you know the truth. You've already been indoctrinated by the truth. You've read the Scriptures. You know this. He is reemphasizing the truth. In fact, throughout this letter, you get the impression that Jude is not conveying a new information. He's not saying, let me tell you the truth. He said, you know the truth. And throughout this letter, you just read, you just understand. Judas telling him, he's conveying this to them. You already know this. Most Christians already know the truth. They just don't live the truth. 
They know the truth, they just don't want to apply it to their lives and keep it in their brain. Jude is reminding us. He's trying to restore the truth. He's trying to reemphasize the facts. He is constantly reminding us the importance of the ca- be caution with, to caution them about the truth. For example, in, if you note verse 5 in the book of Jude, he said, I will therefore put you in remembrance, though he once knew this. He tries to remind them of something they once knew and now do not remember whether by, by, because they, don't, they want to forget it, because they don't want to follow it. In verse 17 through 19, but you dear friends, again I read it, remember the, the apostles before, they've already told you this. These people have come and now they're trying to divide you, divide you away from the word of God, divide you among the people of God. Jude has reminded us what to expect. He is saying, don't be shocked, don't be surprised. Over and over again, we have been told and warned. In Acts chapter 20, verse 29 through 30, the writer of the book of Acts, for I know this, that after my departing shall grievous wolves enter in among you, not sparing the flock. Also of your own self shall men arise. Otherwise, of your own body of Christ, of your own church, of your own fellowship, of your own family, speaking perverse things, to draw away disciples from you. Otherwise, he's saying, the very people that you win to Jesus, the very people that are new converts, the very people who started up in your church, that who began to follow Jesus Christ, the very ones that sat with you, who took the Lord's Supper with you, who sat there and were taught with you, and understood the Word of God, who are even now become young teachers and followers in the faith. Those very ones, the grievous wolves have come. And guess what happened? They are now departing from the faith. These wolves had got their attention. And now they've got the very soul of those individuals. Paul said in 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 1, Now the Spirit speaketh, especially in the last times, and the latter days, some shall depart from the faith, given heeds, to seducing spirits and doctrines of the devil. He warns in chapter 3 of 2 Timothy verse 1, This know also that in last days perilous, terrible, grievous times shall come. Peter said in 2 Peter chapter 3 verse 3, Knowing this first, that there shall come a time in the last days, scoffers at walking after their own lust. When you read throughout the New Testament, you see the warning after warning after warning concerning the last days, and the last times. This refers to the days before Jesus Christ's death and resurrection, or after Jesus' death and resurrection. The moment Jesus Christ died, and the moment he was resurrected from the dead, from that point on, the last days began. Once he was resurrected, then you have the last days becoming. These are days of false teachers who would raise their false heads up, and, their, and they would literally are false teachers, deceiving Many. Here's the problem. If you're not grounded in the Word, you'll be drowned in His Word, the devil's Word. Oh, there are many times of scoffers who make fun, who mock, who deliberately try to shame the child of God for their beliefs and for their practices. We ought to be expect this because He's warned us over and over again. What is amazing is that they do not come from the outside of the church. They come from the inside of the church. We're always walk, looking for false doctors, to, a doctor or false teachers come from outside. Oh, no, no, no. They come from the inside. That's why it's very, very dangerous just to let anybody teach a Sunday school class. I, I tell you, church, it's dangerous for churches to vote on t- Sunday school teachers. Why, you say, preacher? This is what happens. People just come together and just get a list of names and they vote on them to be Sunday school teachers. You just opened the doors for false, false teachers. I don't believe that. You just voted in teachers, uh, teachers that you haven't checked their background. You don't know if they're walking by faith. You don't know what their doctrine is. You've never tested them. There have been churches that elected to teachers, literally homosexuals. They don't know their private background. The pastor does, but he can't say anything. Did you know that? But the church can vote them in. That's happened in Baptist churches and free will Baptist churches because their bylaws says this is the way it's going to happen. I've warned churches. 
Ah, oh, you know what you're talking about. Then they called me, said, would you come to our church and straighten this out? I said, legally, you can't do anything about it until you change your constitution. And by the way, because you're, you wouldn't change your bylaws and constitution, when I told you to before it happened, they can take over your church now. Oh, by the way, those two churches, no longer free will Baptist churches, and the very people they voted in are now co-pastors. And one of them is a woman. It's not like it used to be, folks. These are last days. And they're after the true church. And we got, I get so tired of people say, well, we always did it this way. Some of you always had teeth. <laughs> Some of you always had hair. Well, you always, some of you used to walk in high heel shoes. By the way, I don't know how you do that. I tried it. Now, don't go out of here and make fun of me. <laughs> but I had sisters. One of my sisters wore some high heels. And, and one day I was in her room, well, in their room, because it, we only had two bedrooms. And I went there and said, you know what? I'm going to try this on. I like to broke my blooming neck. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> so I'm trying to walk. I'm like, I kicked those things across that room, and I got out of that room. My ankles were sore for days. Man, if I broke my ankle, what am I going to tell Dad? My dad was a real man, okay? Can't you imagine? He said, Dad, well, how'd you break your ankle? Well, you know what I'd do? I'd have lied and been proud of it. And then later asked Jesus to forgive me. I ain't going to tell my dad I was trying to walk high hell shoes. Would you? No. I may be dumb, but I'm not stupid. <laughs> my dad is dead. Oh, my goodness, I just remembered. This is being taped. I have brothers and sisters that's going to hear this. Let me fix it. Let me fix it. I'm lying to you tonight. That didn't happen. <laughs> sometimes I get, a, 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 sometimes I just open my mouth and insert my foot. Now I'm going to get back on the subject. I'm just going to worry from now on. Remember when you used to play hide and seek? Remember that? One person, he would count to 100, have his eyes closed, and then he'd say, ready or not, I hear I come. During that time while he's counting, we're supposed to hide. Listen, the count and preparation are through. And it's time for us to prepare because Satan is coming. Whether you're ready or not, he's coming. His false teachers are coming. The time of being prepared for him to come is over. We have better be prepared for him and his false teachers to come. It's too late to prepare once he enters the door. When we are unprepared, we get fearful. We are unprepared and we get downright nervous. We don't know what to say or we don't know anything. Listen, we've been warned and we've been challenged and we've been charged to be prepared. Therefore, we've got to be worried already. Listen, let us not be shocked, but be sure what we expect and be sure we're ready. Number two, not only caution, but note the compassion. We ought to show and share our love for God. That is strange to me. False teachers are coming. They're trying to destroy us. He cautions us, and then he gives compassion. Look at verse 20 and 21. But you, dear friends, same passage, same connotation. By building yourself, yourself up in the most holy faith, pray in the Holy Spirit. Now notice what he said in verse 1. Keep yourself in God's love as you wait for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ. To bring you to eternal life. That's amazing. What ought we to be, what should our response be? I mean, when we face a false teacher. Now I'm telling you, I know what false teachers do. They destroy God's people. What do we know? Are we, do, 
We do know they're coming. I mean, honestly, we do know. And, and what will we do for our defense? Have we built a wall of defense? We ought to. Have we sheltered ourselves in the Word of God? We ought to. Have we put up a strong door of protection? We ought to. And when the first sign of them shows up, its dirty face, we ought to be ready. But notice in verse 21, Jude tells us to keep ourselves in the love of God. Stand fast and sure, be sure you have spiritual a spiritual stand, but we must not confront them and our, we have to be totally under the control of the Word of God and the Spirit of God. Notice what he says in verse 20, 21. But you, dear friend, by building yourself up in the most holy faith and praying in the Holy Spirit, keep yourself in God's love as you wait for the mercy of the Lord Jesus Christ to bring you into eternal life. So notice a few truths. First of all, first command, keep yourself in God's love. After giving the command, he notices that he gives us some thoughts here. He said, be building yourself up in the most holy faith. And then he says, pray in the Holy Spirit. So in order to keep ourselves in love of God, there are two things we ought to know. Number one, we've got to build ourselves up in the most holy faith. Otherwise, we have got to get in God's Word. We have to saturate our life. When we saturate our, wi- our lives with the Word of God, we have the Holy Spirit within us. Because I'm not going to understand the Word of God unless I have the Holy Spirit of God. So in doing that, I'm building myself in the Word of God, saturated by the oil of the Holy Spirit of God, and then what happens, I'm going to be able to pray in the Holy Holy Spirit. Now, there are some people interpret that by speaking in tongues. It has no reference to that at all. In order to keep ourselves in the love of God or with God, we have to do those two. We've got to do things in order to keep ourselves in order and in God's love. We've got to devote ourselves to growth in faith, and in prayer, and in sanctification. The commandment, too, is keep yourself. Now, notice this command or charge is to the individual, not necessarily the church collectively. Now, I know some people are going to take a challenge. Me, I'm used to challenges. But these are individual commandments. These are personal commandments. When I got saved, I had a personal commandment from God. When I got saved, the whole church didn't get saved. When I got called to preach, the whole church did not get called to God to preach. I got saved personally. I got called to preach personally. I got baptized personally. I have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. Because if I sin, God doesn't judge the whole church. He judges me. He convicts me. I have a relationship with him. He convicts me. He doesn't, if I sin, he doesn't convict Glenn. He convicts me. When I stand before Jesus, he judges me for my relationship with him. We got to understand that you have your own individual life. You serve God and you are answerable to what you do as a Christian individually. I'm so glad that I know him personally. I know him personally, don't you? Amen. And anybody that tells you you have no personal relationship with God does not know the Word of God. Get away from them. They're lying. Because you can't get saved if you don't have a personal relationship enough to get to know Jesus Christ as your personal Savior. This is an ongoing commandment, commit for the individual. As a church, one of the main purposes of the church is for believers to keep themselves in the love of God. In fact, as a church, we're to help people get right with God. We're to help people stay right with God. We're to help people literally to continue to believe and to have their love checked in their, in for the Lord Jesus Christ. Thirdly, consider this. Jude in verse 1 says, The servant of the Lord Jesus Christ, the brother of James, to them that are sanctified by God the Father and preserved in Jesus Christ and called. As a child of God, we're called. As a child of God, we're protected by the Lord Jesus Christ. God calls us. He guards us. He has our back. He watches over us. Note verse 21. And keep yourself in the God's love. This is not contradiction. Contradiction. God does does his part, and we do our part. When you get saved, you're not a robot. When you get saved, God doesn't make you love him. God doesn't make you walk for him. God doesn't make you do anything. Before you got saved, God doesn't make you get saved. You have a free will. 
before you get saved, and you have a free will after you get saved. God will call you, but you have to answer. After you get saved, God will bring you to certain things, but you're the one that has to be willing to do it. Listen, when God called me to preach, if I didn't say, if I, I could have said no, then I would have lived a miserable life, but I could have said no, and I wouldn't be here tonight. And you can say no to a lot of things. Listen to me. God does everything possible and everything necessary for us to live the Christian life. But we could say no to Him. I mean, people know people that when they got saved, but then they never lived for God. What is Jude's implication here? He is saying for us to keep ourselves anchored in the love of God. Let it be based, the basis of our living. Let us hold up the factor of the God loving us that we ought to love others. God has unconditional love for us. And let us reply with the same love to those, even if they're false teachers. No one has a right to hate anybody. Someone has, actually, has said, actually, moving ahead in Christian life often involves looking to the past. Now listen to this. The foundation must be secured before the building can go up. We can never grow away from our roots. We can only grow through them. If I'm saved and I have a strong foundation, I can grow. When I'm saved and I have a weak foundation, I will crumble. My past relationship with God determines my future relationship with God. Does that make sense? You understand that? Some of you are going. Where am I? What am I going to say? I love preaching. It's the looks on people's faces. What do you say? The best antidote to the virus of false teaching, fake teaching, is to be steadfast in the faith. So let us not be shocked, and let us continue in the compassion with the Lord Jesus Christ. Not only the caution and the compassion, but thirdly, notice the challenge. Connect with those who are strained. Look at verse 22 23. Be merciful through those who doubt. Listen to me carefully. Not a person in this room who's been saved, who, who never in their life doubted. Everyone here have had time of doubt. How many, you know, when you got, you're dating your, your girlfriend, I hope now she's your wife. How many remember your first girlfriend? How many remember your last girlfriend? How many of the last girlfriends not your wife? Whew. <laughs> I was safe there. How many remember your first girlfriend? What was her name, bud? Diane. Diane. Alan, what was your first name, girlfriend? Joyce. Okay, first girlfriend. Rob. Rob. Hello, Rob. You ain't gonna tell me, are you? <laughs> That's a smart man. <laughs> I like it. I pointed to him and he went the other way. He ain't gonna give me. Chris, what's your first girlfriend's name? He ain't gonna tell me either. There's two smart men. Uh, uh, let's see who. Phil, who is your first girlfriend? You're not gonna tell me. It wasn't her, was it? Nope. Was she beautiful? Nope. <laughs> There's some chickens in there. Mike, Mike. <laughs> Here's what Mike did. Jason, first girlfriend. Ashley. Was she beautiful? No. Yeah, ugly. What? Ugly is ugly, just ugly. Here's how he said it. She's ugly. <laughs> Barry, what's your first girlfriend? Who? Julie. Julie. Okay. <laughs> Just in case he gets out. Rick, first girlfriend. Deborah. Okay, Richard, what was your first girlfriend's name? <laughs> and there were so many of them. Ed, first girlfriend's name. Huh? What? Go for it. I'm out of here. <laughs> Rodney. He's playing it safe. This guy's young, though. 
Yeah. <laughs> Who's your first? Allison. Allison. Pretty? No. Boy, we have a lot of men who had an <laughs> ugly girlfriend. Glenn? Linda. Linda. Was she pretty? Yes. Oh. Prettier than Carol? <laughs> Smart man. Yeah. My first girlfriend was Pam. She's the first woman I kissed outside of my mother. And I'm going to stick to that story. And it is the truth, by the way. In fact, I, you, I've told you this story. I was forced to kiss Pam. My sister, we'd been dating for three months. And my sister, not my sister. No. <laughs> Come on. Come on. I'm telling this story. But I was on the back porch of our house with Pam, and my sister Karen went back there. And here's what she did. She said, y'all ever kiss? Huh? Yeah, no. <laughs> and my sister said, Karen said, have you two ever kissed yet? And we said, no. And so she shuts the, there's a door going in the kitchen. We're on the back porch. She shuts the door. She said, now I'm going to walk out of here, and you cannot come out until you kiss her. She walked out and shut the door, and I looked at Pam. She looked at me, and I, I just pecked her. That's all we did. She, did you get, oh, yeah, we kissed. That was our first kiss. Forced kiss. Seriously. And, uh, I thought about breaking up with her that moment. No, no, not really. But that was our first kiss. Notice what he said. Be merciful to those who doubt. Save others by the snatching them from the fire. Now, here it is. Those who doubt, that's the first stage. You start going away through false teachers. They give you something, and you start doubting truth. They give you the lie, contradicting the truth, and you start thinking about it. <clears throat> and you start doubting the truth. And so what he's saying here. You have compassion. You're not going to bring anybody back by challenging them and arguing with them. You have compassion. So he said, show compassion to them. Be merciful. Secondly, he said, save others. You've got to literally grab them and snatch them out of the fire. They went farther. Now what they've done, now they're into false teaching. They're starting to believe it. You've got to snatch them away from false teachers. You got to be more active. You do it in love, but you got to grab them and save them. They're in the fire. They're starting to burn. And then the third group, he said, and then he said, mixed with fear, hating, even the clothes stained with corrupted flesh. These folks are into it. Their very self is now fleshly and has the blood of corrupted flesh. These individuals are literally hanging on the abysses of hell. They're dangerous. No, now Jude begins to speak of false teachers and the victims of these false teachers. They're being led astray. They're being deceived. And Jude, with all that he has within him, speaks with firmness and boldness concerning these false teachers. He speaks of the danger and the boldness of these false teachers. They don't care. He literally tries to encourage the believers to continue in the faith. And he reminds them of their love for God. And Jude literally demonstrates how we are to handle and what we are to, uh, to do with these false teachers. And notice how he separates this group. Notice he said, be merciful. Notice that he deals with each one. To those who doubt, these are the ones in the church who are being swayed. They're beginning to think. They're wavering. Seems like they're beginning to doubt the Word of God and the, and the Christian faith and the love of God. And they're questioning their faith. They're starting to believe. Maybe it's not true. I can imagine they're thinking, can I truly believe the truth of the Word of God? Is the Bible really real? And God and Judas said, have mercy on these people. And the second group, he talks about those who be, needs to be snatched from the fire. Know that Jude uses the word fire uh, to characterize the coming judgment. These are the ones who are on the fence. They're teeter-tottering on the fence. They're on the very edge of real danger. They're being influenced to the very sense that they're actually starting to believe these false teachers. We must snatch them, grab them, rescue them. They're in true danger to those who have shown mercy Mixed with fear, hating, even to the clothes stain. Is Jude talking about the false teachers? They have totally abandoned the truth. They now accepted the lie. They've gone beyond redemption. They have abandoned the faith of false teachers like the false teachers. Their garments are stained by the flesh. These individuals are, it's pretty graphic. They're way out there. I know it's, this graphic is really terribly graphic if you really understand these words. He says, show mercy. Be careful. Because these people at the place that if you're not careful, they can pull you into that fire. 
I have been involved with demons in the sense that I've worked with people who were demon-possessed. You have to understand when a demon comes out of a body, it goes into another warm body. And if you're in a congregation, I don't mess with demons in a congregation. I don't know who's right with God and who's not. Christians can be demon oppressed, but they cannot be demon possessed. There's a world of difference. But a demon, when it leaves a body, it does go into another body. Demons have spoken to me and to my youth director. You don't ever want to hear that. It will make the hair on the back of your neck stand up. It's the awfulest feeling you'll ever get. It'll make you want to run. I will tell you this. The best thing you can do is run. You cannot, you cannot fight Satan alone. There were times that we had to deal with a demon girl, demon possessed girl, 16 years old. I will not tell you the total story. It's Peter Davids, put it this way. One is working on the edge of the fire, so to speak. Not only are they being rescued at risk, but the rescuer are endangering themselves. Sin is deceitful enough that those who try to help those others themselves get trapped. That is no reason not to show mercy, but every reason to have fear. There has to be a balance. When responding to false teaching, you need to do something. You, sometimes you have to get medical treatment. And you have to have precautions. And so you have to be careful. Well, let's conclude this tonight real quickly. What a powerful, what a necessary book for today. Jude is dealing with present day problems and dangers that individuals and churches are dealing with today. And I personally know of incidents that I have had to deal with and churches have had to deal with today. We've got to be, have discerning spirits so we can be able to recognize and be able to point out dangers and people who are involved with false teaching. We've got to be able to have clear and concise biblical responses to, to those who deceive heresy. The Bible College Quartet came to our church in Newcastle, Indiana. At that time, there was a great movement of the charismatic movement. And in the Sunday school hour, the Bible College Quartet was singing. Men came in the back of our church, came and sat on the second row. I was sitting on the front row on this side. And a man jumped up and began to speak in an, unquote unknown tongue. And the poor boys in the college quartet had never seen it nor heard it. And immediately I popped up and asked, is there an interpreter? And no one interpreted. And I went to him and I said, young man, you're out of order. Sit down. And immediately he started cussing me. Pretty good evident that it wasn't the Spirit of God. And immediately two of our ushers and then four of our ushers came down. And they picked him up and they escorted him out back. <coughs> backwards, because he didn't want to go forwards. On the way out backwards, he was kicking his feet and cussing a blue streak. Now I got a picture of the quartet. They had their mics. And these are four, and most of them, I think, freshmen and sophomores. Here, are, here they are. They stopped their singing, and here they are. And the mice were going. And they got him out, and I told the congregation, and I turned to them, I said, continue. And they said, <laughs> I said, just finish your song. I said, you're supposed to do the whole hour. And so I said, let's ha take a break. They went back. We had prayer with them. I said, folks, just hold on a minute. Well, I looked at the congregation. They were going, <laughs> they'd never seen anything like that. So they come back out, and they finish singing. And then we went to, then we went to took a break, and they come back for service. That's a case, not being spirit Christ-filled, but being demon-filled. 
That's how easy it can happen in a church. You better be ready. You better be ready. It can happen here just like that. And, and, and Jude is warning us, be ready. Know the truth. The truth will set you free. And it could happen. Somebody could walk up to you in a minute and start talking to you about the truth. And just like that, insert a lie and come back to the truth. You better know the truth so when they insert the lie, you can kick it out. Amen? Amen. You shall know the truth, and the truth will set you free. Yes. But if you don't know all the truth, it's going to hurt you. You know, I love you folks. I love you watching me preach. Your eyes, it's like this. Or this. I turn my phone off when you say that. <laughs> you are great folks. I love you. God loves you. Have a great week. You are special. You are unique, and you're one of a kind. Go with God. This is going to be a great week. I believe it with all my heart. This has been a great day, and God has used some wonderful things today. In my life, I've seen. We had a children's church committee meeting. You will not believe the burden these four people have for the children. You will not believe the wisdom they had as we talked and as we prayed and the humility that they have and the unity that came from these four. Amen. I stand amazed, not shocked, I know them, but just amazed of the wisdom that came out of that meeting. We're going to have another one. Maybe it's going to take three to get me straightened out. Oh, okay. Four? Lisa back there is giving me a hard time. She just come on board recently, and ever since she's been on board, I've been having heart pains, chest pains. <laughs> if, I fell, if I fell over with a heart attack, here's what she would You back up, back up. He'll be all right. If he's still on the floor in the morning, Beth will find him and call the ambulance. Just back off. Just go home and pray for him. He'll be all right. Thank you. I love you. Uh, Phil, you got something? Oh, no. This is dangerous. Yes, sir. It is?